Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth in the series of Bite Size Training for All as part of the celebration of 50 years of the Protection of Rex Act. I'm Peter Knott, Education Manager of the Nautical Archaeology Society. Today's webinar is Monitoring Rex for Climate Change Indicators. The presenter today will be Alison James from MSTS Marine and Heritage. Before Hello, everyone. Before we start, I thought it might be useful to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me and to hopefully illustrate what makes me the person who sat here talking to you about this subject. My name is Alison James and I work for MSDS Marine. We're a specialist marine and coastal contractor based in Derbyshire in the UK. I'm a director at MSDS and over the last few years, we've increasingly been thinking about climate change and evidence for it in the marine environment as part of our work. Prior to working at MSDS, I worked for Historic England and I am also an NAS trustee. But what about my climate change experience? Well, as a company, this has been something we've been very much thinking about for many years now. And I've been on a bit of a journey since um, we started by appointing an internal environmental champion. And that made us really think about everything we do in the course of our work, both in the office and on field work. That led to thinking about how we could look for indicators of climate change in the course of our field work on rec sites. We've completed a climate change focused project on the Bronze Bell Protected Rec Site in North Wales. And I'll talk about that quite a bit during this session. The work we did there is now really underpinning the way we think about our work on other rec sites. This session is intended to be a bite-sized snippet of training aimed at giving you some useful tools and knowledge to start developing how you think about climate change in the course of your diving or other even intertidal site investigations you might be involved with. Because it's bite-sized, there's not going to be time to go into every aspect of climate change, but hopefully I'll give you a few things to start to think about to get you started. Climate change is an increasing threat to the historic environment. And with this year marking the 50th anniversary of the Protection of Rex Act, it seems like a really great opportunity to help people start to think about climate change and its impact on underwater cultural heritage so that we can mitigate potential impacts to ensure that sites continue to be protective. Effective heritage protection is reliant on the provision of field observations um, to underpin protection and management, and that includes climate change related observations. Divers are by far the best place to see what's happening on a wreck and to report it to authorities. Recent techniques that we've been developing in relation to climate change on the Bronze Bell Protected Wreck site as part of our work for Cherish have shown there are really simple things that divers can do to help monitor climate change and to collect meaningful data that will help inform responses that enable better protection in coming years. This bite-sized training is intended to provide some simple things divers can do to help aid um, scientists in their understanding and responses to climate change. Some topics may be familiar to some of you, but hopefully there'll be something new and of use to everybody watching. I am going to cover what do we mean by climate change? Um, what research has been done? What's the role of citizen science? What can divers do? Um, what do we need to think about with our data? Um, who wants our data and what training is out there? Ultimately though, climate change investigation in relation to underwater cultural heritage is very much in its infancy. So it's a starting point, but I'm always more than happy to provide advice and to help discuss things further. Climate change then, what do we mean by it? Well, it refers to long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. Such shifts can be natural uh, due to changes in the sun's activity or due to large volcanic eruptions. But very much since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. Now, burning fossil fuels generates greenhouse gas emissions and they act like a blanket wrapped around the earth, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperatures. The main greenhouse gases that are causing climate change include carbon dioxide and methane, and they come from many places, including the fossil fuels we use for driving cars or the coal we use for heating our homes. Clearing land and cutting down forests can also release carbon dioxide, and agriculture as well as oil and gas operations really are major sources of methane emissions. So energy, industry, transport, buildings, agriculture and land use are among the main sectors that cause those greenhouse gases. 
Climate change scientists have shown humans are responsible for virtually all global warming over the last 200 years. Human activities, like the ones I've just mentioned, are causing those greenhouse gases and they're warming the world faster than at any time in the last 2000 years. The average temperature of the Earth's surface is now about 1.1 degrees warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s. And it's warmer than any time in the last 100,000 years. The last decade was the warmest on record, and each of the last four decades before that were warmer than any previous decade since 1850. Many people think climate change mainly means warmer temperatures. It's a conversation I frequently have um, at home and in the office, but temperature rise is only the beginning of the story. The earth is a system and everything is connected and changes in one area can influence changes in all others. The consequences of climate change now include intense droughts, water scarcity, severe fires, rising sea levels, flooding, melting polar ice, catastrophic storms and declining biodiversity. It's a scary picture. I have to say it seems quite ironic that I'm sat here talking about this from our office in Derbyshire in the week Derby has hit, been hit by the highest level of flooding we've ever seen. To date though, there's been very little consideration given to how climate change might affect archeological remains underwater. Although I do want to flag a blog written by my then colleague, Mark Dunkley back in 2013, which was one of the first to note some of the issues I'll talk about today. There's a link to that article and a QR code for you um, on the screen. There's been much more consideration given to how climate change will affect the built environment and coastal communities. It's been quite clear coastal communities and coastal heritage are at the forefront of the effects of climate change, but we do know that the marine environment will feel the impact through sea level rise, increased temperatures, ocean acidification and changes in ocean circulation. In the UK, sea temperatures have risen two degrees in the past 40 years alone, and scientists are starting to see the effects of this as the range of warm water species is expanding in UK waters and pushing further north into colder waters. One particular effect of ocean warming already visible in UK is the northward migration of invasive species and of particular interest is the black tip shipworm. Now that's a species of shipworm that's active all year and it's begun to invade the UK from more southerly latitudes as a result of that sea temperature increase. It's been recorded in various locations along the south coast and even on the Mary Rose protected wreck site in the Solent. And in 2005, it was recorded on the coast at Sandwich in Kent, which is somewhere the NAS do a lot of work. You can see the effects of shipworm on these two images on the slide, provided by my friend and colleague, Angela Middleton at Historic England. The top image shows a pulley block that is showing the effects of woodworm, of shipworm, sorry, not woodworm. The second is an X-ray of an oak test block placed into a wreck where shipworm was known to be present. When it entered the water, the block was a perfect um, rectangular shape. But after being on the um, wreck, you can see the channels left in that oak block by the shipworm and the effect they've had on that X-ray. The thing with shipworm can be that on the surface, wooden artifacts can still look really complete and well preserved. But because the shipworm burrows tunnels into the wood, the inside can be riddled and heavily decayed and eaten away. So a good appearance on the outside can be deceptive and x-rays can show you the real picture of that decay. It's considered to be a major threat to wooden wrecks and other wooden structures. So if we're going to see more species like this in UK waters, we need to know that they're there so we can start to tackle the threat. The sea is becoming more acidic as it absorbs increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. We don't know yet the long-term effect this will have on underwater cultural heritage, but it will certainly have an impact on both wooden and metal wrecks. Decrease increases in ocean pH certainly have the potential to increase current rates of metal corrosion. It's believed that changes in ocean temperature and wind patterns resulting from the combined effects of overall climate change will affect and alter oceanic currents. However, the large scale circulation patterns of the Atlantic, which help to maintain the relatively temperate climate of Northern Europe, have shown high variability in recent years, but there's no clear trend there. What is clear though, is it's a changing picture and we don't yet have all the answers to how these changes will affect wrecks and underwater cultural heritage. So what role is there for divers in helping to understand all of this? 
Well, archaeologists and managers of heritage assets across the world are seeing the effects of climate change on archaeological sites. Increasingly, archaeologists are embracing things learned in a natural environment for how we respond to the challenges practically. And one way that has been long established in the natural environment is the role of citizen science in making a contribution to knowledge. In the UK, projects such as Citizen in England and Cherish in Wales and Ireland have really taken this on board with work to work with communities to record heritage under threat of climate change, be it promontory forts at risk of collapse into the sea or exposed timbers on the foreshore. What we as a marine archaeology community now need to do though is take that citizen science underwater and start gathering meaningful, accessible data that can help inform responsive and proactive methodologies to tackle climate change induced problems. So before I look at those practical things, what else is happening? Well, perhaps most importantly, it's the UN Decade of Ocean Science. And this recognises there's a pressing need to collectively find transformative solutions to the existing and future challenges that face the ocean. The solutions will be many and varied and they'll differ in their form and scale to best respond to regional, national and local contexts. Um, the solutions themselves are going to need to evolve and adapt to respond to a changing climate. The UN really do recognise that the world requires a transformational, large scale, adequately resourced, innovative campaign to mainstream ocean science. What's needed is something that will cut across geographies, including the land sea interface, and it needs to be intergenerational, um, recognise and readdress gender disparities in ocean science and be of sufficiently long term duration to deliver that lasting change. Leading on from that, the Ocean Decade Heritage Network was set up following the development of the Decade of Ocean Science, and the network aims to promote the decade, provide a platform for engagement, communication and knowledge sharing, and to connect archaeologists and specialists for interdisciplinary marine research. As the network has said, it's not just how can cultural heritage help deliver the decade, but without cultural heritage, how can you even deliver the decade in the first place? It's still relatively early days to see what will come out of these initiatives, but they are important backdrops for climate change and underwater cultural heritage. So that's all high level, but what is happening practically underwater? To date, the most high profile um, underwater initiative looking at climate change has been GERT, which stands for Gathering Information via Recreation on Technical Scientific Divers. This project has been led by Andrew Viduka in Australia, and it's a citizen science project that aims to train divers to record physical and natural features of underwater cultural heritage in Australasia. The data collected then feeds into the Australasian Underwater Cultural Heritage Database. The GERT methodology has been developed to enable better understanding of the condition of wreck sites and the climate change factors driving their preservation or deterioration. It also aims to encourage interested people to have an active and positive public archaeology role. Also in Australia, but less risk focused, is the Red Map, so Range Extension Database and Mapping Project, led by the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies. Red Map uses a citizen science approach to recording uncommon species identified off the coast of Australia. And the project aim is to identify species migration in response to environmental changes. Looking to the UK though, we have Sea Search and we also have things like the Big Seaweed Search, focusing on the natural underwater environment. Sea Search is a citizen science project aimed at monitoring uh, marine biodiversity. Um, and the Big Seaweed Search is a citizen science approach for recording specific climate change indicator species of seaweed, and both are led by the Marine Conservation Society. Sea Search is a project for recreational divers and snorkelers who want to do their bit for the marine environment by collecting information about habitats, plants and animals that they see under the water. And the Marine Conservation Society collects sea search information from sites all around Britain and Ireland, including the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. So wherever you dive or snorkel, you can take part. The Big Sea Research is a Marine Conservation Society and Natural, Historic Muse Natural History Museum initiative to response, uh, to response, in response to changes in our ocean as a result of climate change. 
These changes can cause some seaweed species to move or change how they grow as they adapt to shifting conditions in the water. The Big Seaweed Search is tracking and recording these changes around the coast each year so that scientists can understand the impact of environmental change on our seas. The information um, collected supports real scientific research, which scientists can use to protect the ocean and seaweeds for the future. They're on the lookout for 14 different seaweed species around the UK, which indicate change. They then use the data to investigate rising sea temperature, uh, the arrival and spread of non-native species of seaweeds, and to look at the effects of ocean acidification. There are also many cultural heritage climate change initiatives in the UK that look at coastal archaeology and climate change and seek to understand risks and collect data. High profile examples include two that I already mentioned, uh, Citizen and Cherish, but today I'm very much focusing on underwater cultural heritage and specifically wrecks, so I'm not going to talk about them in detail. I will, however, flag the excellent toolkit produced by the Cherish project that is available online. And again, I've put a link and a QR code on the slide for you. The Cherish project measured, mapped and supplied studies. Sorry. The Cherish project measured, mapped and studied threatened coastal heritage sites of Ireland and Wales using a range of innovative methods. They then created a toolkit um, approach, merging the disciplines of archaeology, remote sensing, geography, paleoecology, geomorphology, maritime survey, underwater archaeology and geosurvey to understand how climate change is affecting coastlines. You can explore the different methods and techniques used by the Cherish project on their website. The underwater survey element very much focuses on geophysical survey. Um, and very much sort of at the top end of the budget of geophysical survey. So very much outside the price range of most divers, which is why I'm not going into it in greater detail during this presentation. So let's move on and look at practical things that you as divers can do to monitor wrecks for evidence of climate change. I think there are two or three things that we could all be doing very easily to add to a growing body of evidence. The first step is the all important baseline environmental monitoring. We're at the start of how we manage monitoring wrecks for evidence of climate change, and therefore we always need a baseline point to start from. Establishing a repeatable scientific approach is going to be really important. Recording the marine species present is a great indicator for understanding climate change, as marine species are often extremely vulnerable to even slight changes to their environment. On the Bronze Bell wreck, our team were able to record um, many different fit species of fish, including uh, cork wing wrasse, tompot blenny, uh, two-spotted goby and bib, and others were observed. However, confident identification couldn't be made, but we think there were things like bream, cod and whiting, as well as the fish that you can see on the screen here, which it's not been possible to narrow down to a UK species. We think it's rashate, um, but no one, not even marine biologists, have yet been able to give it a firm identification. So could this little fish be evidence of climate change affecting the site? We simply don't know at the moment, but it's hoped with monitoring over future years, we might start to understand more. As well as the fish, we I observed uh, different species of crab and lobster. And using the GoPro footage, it was possible to identify six different types of sponge on the site, with most of those appearing on the marble blocks at the centre of the site. Um, they had great names. We had golf ball sponge, um, dead men's fingers, that was great, as well as what I think is the best named sponge ever, the prawn cracker sponge. For our team, we were able to make limited observations in the field, but then benefited um, from someone with a marine biological background reviewing our GoPro footage post-diving. That worked really well for us, but you may have a fish expert on your dive team who can do it on the day. We also spoke to a diver who's got over 40 years of experience diving on the site. He gave us some great anecdotal evidence of seeing fish species change on the wreck over time. And that sort of information is incredibly important to capture it um, if you can. And once you have the baseline, you have to start monitoring a site for change. So do you see new fish coming in? Is there new marine growth present? Can you see things? Are you seeing things that have not previously been there? And it's really important to start to record all of these things in your site archive. The next step I would suggest is establishing key locations on the wreck where you can take repeatable photographs. This will help hugely with monitoring change in future. 
With the Bronze Bell, we were really lucky. We had a huge image bank of photos that had been taken nearly 20 years ago by Wessex Archaeology. And we were able to establish where on site these were taken. And once we did that, we were able to repeat the photographs and mark them onto a site plan so that anyone visiting the site in future can repeat them. So as well as looking forward to new photos, look back into your archive and see what you can do retrospectively, because there may be information sitting there that just needs looking at in a new way. We're there back for back to the importance of having a site plan, which most people who've been involved with any archaeology or any NAS training will be familiar with. I've seen something recently on land sites quite a lot where photo monitoring points um, are installed so that people physically stand with their camera or their phone on top of a post um, to take a photo. Now, these are brilliant. They may be trickier to install or replicate underwater, but I think I, I'm quite keen to try this in future. The photo um, on the left here is from the Surf Rider project in California, um, and the one on the right is from another project also in America. The Surf Rider project is a community science-led project that uses a fixed camera mount to allow beachgoers to photograph the shoreline from fixed points, so photo points, in order to systematically capture changes in the vegetation, the morphology of the sand dunes, and um, look for things like sea level rise and beach evolution over time. This approach of repeatable photography is going to be a really important one for us on rec sites, although I appreciate on some sites with terrible visibility, the approach isn't going to be practical. So as with everything, it's a case of adapting to the site that you're working on. I have a photo on the screen here of a rather expensive seabed data logger, but I appreciate again, not everybody has the budget to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on scientific equipment to track temperature, turbidity and salinity. But there are simple things that you can do. Most divers have a computer that will easily log temperature, make a note of it on the surface and on the seabed, actually start to keep some regular records. pH monitoring can also be simple. We use these handheld digital monitors and we get our divers to take samples um, in little pots on the surface and on the seabed during their dive. And then we use the monitor to test it when they return to the boat. They're readily available online, they cost under £10 and, and they're really easy to use. The main issue we find is actually ensuring our divers return to the boat with the sample pots and that they aren't adding to the issues of marine plastic by losing the pots along the way. Um, but there's not really a lot I can do about that other than telling people to make sure they zip them into their pockets. So if you go and collect all this data, what do you need to do with it? Well, any data collected should be underpinned by the FAIR principles of data. So it should be findable, and you need to think about how you're making your data and metadata easy to find. It needs to be accessible. How can people access all this data that you're collecting? It needs to be interoperable. So make sure your data can be integrated with other data applications and workflows, and it should be reusable. So you need well-described data and metadata which will optimize the potential for reuse of it. Accessibility is a huge issue for us with this. There is no point collecting data if you aren't going to make it available to researchers. But at this point, there is no easy way of sharing it to the wider world in any one place. At the moment, there's no easy way for upskilled citizen scientists or divers who want to deposit meaningful data. There is no access, easily accessible online portal to submit your information to, although it's something we are strongly pushing for for the future. For protected rec sites, a condition of license access is an annual report to the heritage agencies. So including the data you've collected in that report would be a good place to start compiling the information. But there's also potential to contribute to um, so much more. And the data could be added to national citizen science initiatives, such as the Big Seaweed Search and other sea life surveys, such as Sea Search. Changes to marine life are one of the first indicators of climate change on a site. So it's really important that as marine archaeologists and divers, we don't ignore it, but we start to look at our sites holistically and we capture the changes that we're seeing. Any data you collect and any changes you observe will become an important part of the site archive long term. So I'm hoping everyone listening to this talk is interested in getting involved in gathering data. You may decide you want to do more training. So what is out there for you? Well, I've mentioned GERT already um, and Andrew Viduka from GERT offers online training courses for interested divers. When you submit an application to join GERT, your application will be held until you've completed one of their training workshops. 
Their training workshops are available periodically. They're advertised on the homepage of the GERT website, as well as on the GERT Facebook page. So that's a good place to start to look. I've also mentioned Sea Search, and they offer a great way to learn about marine life while doing your bit to protect and restore the ocean. By collecting information about the habitats, plants and animals you see underwater, you'll be helping them track the health of the marine environment and helping to add to the baseline knowledge, which will enable the effects of climate change to be noted in the longer term. The NAS have previously run a combined NAS and Sea Search course specifically adapted for divers keen to record marine wildlife on wrecks. Peter tells me they're planning another NAS and Sea Search course next year. It's not live for booking yet, but do stay tuned to the weekly emails and social media from the NAS for more details on that course. So that's it really for this webinar. We have come to the end of this piece of bite-sized training. I really do hope you have found it a useful starting point. I really am well aware that I don't have all the answers for you, but what I'm hoping I've done is given you something to start thinking about. So just to recap, we've looked at what do we mean by climate change? What research has been done already? What role is there for citizen science and divers? Indeed, what can divers do? What do we need to think about with our data? Who wants our data? And what other training is there? Thank you very much for listening. I do really hope it's been helpful. I've popped my email address on the screen there for you. Please do feel free to contact me for any further help and advice. I'm always happy to chat ideas through, especially ideas of what we can be doing in relation to climate change or to do anything else that might help you get up a project off the ground that can help make a difference to our understanding of climate change or indeed protected wreck sites. Thank you for listening to me. So thank you, Alison, for your presentation today. And thank you again to Historic England for ensuring, ensuring that these bite-sized webinars are free to, for everyone to attend and watch online whenever they like. If you're interested in attending this next uh, talk, then I hope that you can sign up and uh, join us in a month's time for the next in this series of webinars. We do still have quite a few left. This is only the fifth out of, I think it's 11 we've got now. And so please make sure you sign up and either watch live or catch up on YouTube, all of the wonderful experts that we have talking to us for free on these this webinar series.